Prepare for body imaging and exploration. Click directly on the body to begin exploring. To move the body to a new position, click on the rotate body icon. Use the arrow keys or move the mouse to rotate the body. Click the mouse or hit any key to get a cursor. The lungs. The lungs are a vital organ which enables the body to obtain oxygen from the air we breathe and to eliminate carbon dioxide. Breathing is accomplished with the chest wall muscles and the diaphragm muscle which separates the chest cavity from the abdomen. When the chest cavity expands, the lungs expand with it, drawing air down into the lungs. When the chest cavity relaxes, the lungs shrink and waste carbon dioxide is expelled. The lungs are not directly attached to the chest wall. Instead, they are encased in a double layer membrane called the pleura. One of the pleural layers is firmly attached to the lungs, with the other one firmly attached to the chest wall. There's always a small amount of fluid between the two pleural layers, which allows them to freely slide over each other. The lungs are divided into distinct lobes, which are supplied by their own airways, bronchi, and their own arteries. On the right side, there are three main lobes called the upper, middle, and lower lobes. On the left, there are only two lobes called the upper and lower lobes. This anatomy is illustrated in the 3D model above. The fissures that separate the upper and lower lobes on both sides are called the major fissures. The right lung also has a minor fissure that separates the upper and middle lobes. Notice how the minor fissure is nearly horizontal, but the major fissures run at a steep angle. When a doctor listens to the breathing sounds on your back, he or she is listening to the lower lobes, even when the stethoscope is placed high up by the shoulder blades. One of the disorders sometimes seen in the emergency room is collapse of the lung. Surprisingly, the natural tendency of the lungs is to collapse into a small ball near the center of the chest. They are held in their normal expanded state only by the attraction between the two layers of the pleura. If you have ever tried to separate two sheets of wet glass, then you know how this works. Occasionally, air gets between the two pleural layers, causing them to separate, and the lung collapses. This is called a pneumothorax, meaning air in the thorax, chest cavity. The air can either come from the outside because of a penetrating wound, or from the inside because a part of the lung developed a hole in it. Another problem that is sometimes seen is excess water between the two pleural layers. This is called a pleural effusion, a condition commonly referred to as water on the lung. There are many causes for a pleural effusion, some benign and some quite bad. A pleural effusion is typically treated by sticking a needle or a tube into the chest and draining out the fluid. Welcome to the Body Adventure Index. Just click on a letter to access a subject of interest. It is also possible to go directly to a subject by typing the word at any time. DNA. DNA is the molecule which contains all the information for life. It can be thought of as a blueprint or an instruction manual for how everything necessary for life must be done. At the smallest level, DNA is organized into a double helix as shown in the illustration above. 
The DNA helix is then repeatedly coiled to allow more of it to fit into a compact space. In humans, all the DNA is packaged into 46 separate molecules called chromosomes. The chromosomes each contain thousands of genes, with each gene specifying how to make a particular protein necessary for cellular function. Scientists have long thought that the holy grail for understanding human life lies in knowing the entire sequence of human DNA. For this reason, the National Institutes of Health are funding the Human Genome Project. The mission of the Human Genome Project is to sequence all the DNA contained within a human cell. This is a project of enormous magnitude that will likely take many years to complete. Welcome to the Body Adventure Index. Defibrillator. When the pattern of the heartbeat isn't normal, it is called an arrhythmia. Most arrhythmias produce strikingly abnormal EKG tracings. One interesting group of arrhythmias is caused by a block in the heart's normal conduction pathway. Fortunately, this does not stop the heart completely, since there are always some cells below the level of the block that take over the role of initiating the heartbeat. The new pacemaker cells tend to beat too slowly, however, so this isn't really a solution. Definitive treatment for a heart block arrhythmia thus requires placement of a battery-powered pacemaker. The pacemaker can then be programmed to initiate the heartbeat at any desired rate. The most severe arrhythmia is ventricular fibrillation. A heart in ventricular fibrillation just quivers, and it is unable to pump blood. Effective treatment depends on shocking the heart to get all the muscle cells to begin contracting again in an orderly fashion. The machine used to deliver the shock is called a defibrillator. The paddles from a defibrillator are shown in the picture above. The power of the shock is quite great, and it is very important that all the bystanders stay clear when the defibrillator is used. Welcome to the Body Adventure Index. Just click on a letter. Heart attack. People with coronary artery disease are at high risk for having a heart attack. A heart attack occurs when the blood supply to a part of the heart is suddenly cut off and the affected heart muscle dies. The usual cause of a heart attack is the formation of a blood clot at the site of an atherosclerotic plaque. The clot completely blocks the artery, cutting off blood flow beyond it. The medical term for a heart attack is myocardial infarction. Heart attacks are the number one cause of death in Western societies. The risk factors for having a heart attack are well known. These factors include a diet high in fat and cholesterol, smoking, obesity, physical inactivity, high blood pressure, diabetes, and a family history of heart attacks. Fortunately, most of these risk factors are related to lifestyle. It is thus possible for a person to lower their risk of a heart attack if they choose to. Of note, the incidence of heart attacks is four times lower in Japan than it is in the United States. This is because the major risk factors are much less common in that country. The diagnosis of a heart attack is based mostly on the patient's symptoms. Typically, a patient having a heart attack experiences severe chest pain, sweating, nausea, and anxiety. 
The diagnosis is confirmed by an EKG along with blood tests. If a patient arrives at the hospital soon after their symptoms began, they will generally be treated with a medicine, thrombolytic, that works by dissolving blood clots. This treatment is often successful at reopening blocked arteries and limiting the damage done to the heart. The severity of a heart attack is determined by how much of the heart dies. If too large a part of the heart is affected, the remaining heart muscle is unable to continue pumping the blood. Approximately one-third of heart attacks are fatal. Advances in medical care over the past 30 years have greatly improved the outlook for patients that survive a heart attack. the kidneys, there are two kidneys, each about six inches in length. The main functions of the kidneys are to regulate the amount of water and salt within the body, to maintain the proper acid-base balance in the body, and to eliminate waste products from the blood. The kidneys are also responsible for making a few key hormones. One of these hormones, erythropoietin, is responsible for stimulating production of red blood cells, while another, renin, plays an important role in regulating blood pressure. The skull. The skull consists of the cranium, which surrounds the delicate brain and the facial bones. The cranium is formed by eight bones, the frontal bone, two parietal bones, two temporal bones, the occipital bone in the back, the ethmoid bone behind the nose, and the sphenoid bone. The face consists of 14 bones, including the maxilla, upper jaw, and mandible, lower jaw. The bones of the skull are quite hard, and protection of the brain is undoubtedly their most important function. Interestingly, several of the bones are hollow, a feature which reduces their weight. Imagine how heavy your head might feel after a long day if these bones weren't hollow. These air-filled spaces are called the paranasal sinuses because they are located all around the nose. The membranes which line the sinuses sometimes become inflamed because of allergy or infection. This is a common condition referred to as sinusitis. All the skull bones, except the mandible, are held together by immovable joints called sutures. The mandible and the two temporal bones are held together by freely movable joints, which are named, not surprisingly, the temporomandibular joints, TMJ. The TMJs usually work well to permit all the complex motions required for chewing and talking. Some people, however, develop pain in their TMJs. This condition is called temporomandibular joint syndrome. TMJ syndrome is usually the result of spasm of the chewing muscles. Headaches, facial pain, and various popping noises are all common in patients with TMJ syndrome. Treatment is generally directed at reducing the muscle spasms and relieving the pain. Besides protecting the brain, the other major function of the skull is to house the special sense organs, the eyes, vision, ears, hearing, Nose, smell, and tongue, taste, are all located in the skull. The sense of taste is accomplished by the approximately 10,000 taste buds. These are mostly located on the tongue, with a few located at the back of the throat. Surprisingly, there are only four different tastes that can be differentiated by the taste buds alone. Bitter, salty, sour, and sweet. The taste buds for each of these four different tastes are grouped together on the tongue. Of note, the taste buds for sweet are all located at the very tip of the tongue. Our ability to distinguish a rich range of tastes is actually due to our sense of smell, which is much more developed than our sense of taste. The sense of smell is accomplished by special nerve endings that all sit in a small region in the roof of the nose. Our sense of smell is remarkably sensitive. As few as four individual molecules can produce a recognizable smell. The 
heart. The heart is a powerful pump that beats continuously during life to circulate the blood throughout the body. The heart has four separate chambers. There are two atria to receive the blood returning to the heart and two ventricles to pump the blood back out. Each of these four chambers has a one-way valve to ensure that blood flow is always in the forward direction. The heart is actually better described as two pumps that act in series. With each beat, the right ventricle pumps deoxygenated blood to the lungs, and the left ventricle pumps oxygenated blood to the body. The two sides of the heart are not identical, however. The left ventricle is much thicker and stronger than the right ventricle. Why is this so? It is easy to see that the right and left sides of the heart must always pump the same volume of blood. If they didn't, serious bottlenecks would develop in the circulation. However, the resistance to blood flow is much greater in the body than it is in the lungs. The left ventricle thus has to work harder and contract more forcefully to keep up with the right ventricle. This explains why the left ventricle has much thicker muscular walls than the right ventricle. Let us follow the course of a single red blood cell in more detail as it moves through the heart. At the outset of the journey, the blood cell returns from the body via the vena cava and enters the right atrium. The right atrium contracts and pumps the blood cell across the tricuspid valve and into the right ventricle. Soon after that, the right ventricle contracts and pumps the blood cell across the pulmonic valve and into the pulmonary artery. The blood cell can then go either right or left to enter one of the lungs. While in the lungs, the blood cell unloads carbon dioxide and picks up oxygen. Next, the blood cell returns to the left atrium via one of the pulmonary veins. The blood cell then crosses the mitral valve to enter the left ventricle. At this point, the left ventricle contracts forcefully to send the blood cell across the aortic valve and out into the body. After unloading its oxygen somewhere in the body, the blood cell enters a vein and returns via the vena cava to the right atrium where it can begin the cycle once again. On average, this whole journey takes about two minutes. Red blood cells only last about four months before they wear out, but the heart never rests. During an average lifetime, the heart beats approximately 2.5 billion times. The heart is a very well-designed pump indeed. It is more reliable and energy efficient than any pump ever created by man. Save the patient. It's up to you. Doctor, we just received four new admissions and they are all in serious condition. To interview a patient, get more information, or start a procedure, just click on the appropriate console. Click to start. Um, doctor, I was bitten by a crazy dog yesterday and I'm really scared. The bite hurts a lot. I wasn't even doing anything to the dog. My mom's worried I might get rabies. She said you were gonna stick me in the stomach with a bunch of really big needles. Can I leave now?
You have been transported into the patient's brain. Find and zap all of the viruses to cure him. Remember, your patient was bitten by a mad dog just yesterday. Avoid damaging healthy cells. Hurry! Time is of the essence. Great job! You cured the patient of rabies. Rabies is a viral infection of the nervous system. The virus is transmitted to humans by rabid animal bites. Many cases are the result of dog bites. Raccoons and bats are other common carriers. Worldwide, there are an estimated 15,000 cases of rabies each year. There are very few cases in the U.S., however, largely as a result of intensive efforts to vaccinate dogs. Untreated cases are usually fatal. Treatment is given to patients when there is reasonable suspicion of rabies exposure following an animal bite. The primary treatment involves a several week course of anti-rabies antibody shots. The treatment works by enabling the body to eliminate all the rabies viruses before the disease develops. Fortunately, the medicine has changed and it is no longer administered through the stomach. Let's play Body Recall. Click on one of the 12 tiles to see what lies underneath it. Remember what you see. Concentration is the key. The object of the game is to match each picture with its name or with its function. Heart. Lungs. Stomach. Kidneys. Brain. Liver. Great job. 